Hi everyone, welcome back to another civil engineering tutorial. In today's tutorial, we looked at the design of a continuous one-way solid slab. And the design would be as per the Euro code tool. Now, you know, the design process does take time. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna need to divide this series into parts. In this particular part, uh, it, it would be an introductory part. We will look at the problem and we see how to approach it. We'll also discuss some other uh, useful materials. Now, without any further ado, let's get started. Um, a very quick thing, um, I would mention that if you get your hands on this continuous solid slab design, then the continuous beam wouldn't be that of a different. Um, we are, are talking almost about the same thing. Um, some points might arise, yes, during the design process of the beam, but we are not talking about uh, much of a difference, okay? Right, so uh, we're starting off with this. Uh, you are a structure engineer and you have been asked to design this first floor. I've got this dimensions, so you've got this nice sketch. Um, and by the way, I've got another bit of 3D, <coughs> excuse me, a better 3D view of this problem. And well, you have the permanent load here and you have the impost load. Right, now probably the first thing that you might start with is well to tell whether this system is a one-way or a two-way slab and you know uh, from the very basic uh, principle um, you, you have this ratio uh, if you get the longer span or the shorter span if you get it something uh, equal to two or less than two then what you are dealing with is, is, is a two-way slab system in this case and since this tutorial is about the continuous one-way slab then i've got this longer span six meter and divided by 2.5. 2.5 here, uh, I took 2.5 because the 2.5 is the most critical number here. Uh, I mean, if I divide it by the least number 2.2, then I get something uh, even bigger than 2.4. So uh, 2.4 is larger than two. That means I'm dealing with a one-way slab. Now for continuous solid slab is the most common type of um, slabs, right? Whether it's a two-way or a one-way, it doesn't matter, but the continuous uh, solid slab is the most common uh, R uh, in RCC uh, structures and well basically it's the just the monolithic pouring of concrete that uh, makes it uh, the reinforcement integrates into uh, uh, the rebar of the beam as well so um, we have we have uh, basically we have the slabs and the beams all acting together uh, like having just one mass to resist the loading now we have this hogging moment and we have this sagging moment, okay? And if you look at this, okay, this is not a practical example. You would not really find it in um, a real life situation. Uh, yes, you might find this kind of uh, system in bridges, but uh, in RCC uh, buildings, this is not common. Okay, you see this offset, small offsets here. Uh, the slab here, this one here, is resting on it. So whatever kind of loading uh, happens to be here, this one will not be affected at all. There's no such a connection between them. Okay, unlike here, whatever you put here, this one will be affected. Okay, so uh, basically, you can treat this one as uh, simply supports it, um, having only this saggy moment. All right, I've got our example here, and just before going through that, um, let's just understand the one way slab. Now I have these four guys there and they're trying to lift this panel. You see, the closer part you are, the more load that you contribute into lifting. Now these two are of course gonna take uh, much way more than the, the farther apart guys. And this is your understanding by logic. Um, the load here is flowing in just one direction these two might take load, yeah, but not at them as much as uh, compared to these uh, close guys. And you see, when we have the panel here, uh, uh, having uh, a dimension that is um, almost proportional, then everyone will contribute into lifting. So that means the load is basically uh, transferred into two directions. So that makes uh, a two-way slab, and that one here makes a one-way slab. This is a very simple analogy and 
it is of course more complex than that, but this is a ba very basic uh, way of uh, presenting such kind of uh, systems. Right now we have this panel, okay, and if I put the loading on the slab, um, basically the slab takes uh, the loading kinetic per meter square, uh, transfer it to its supporting beam in kinetic per meter, then the beam takes it to the columns, uh, which then is just in Newton, a concentrated load. Uh, columns also take uh, the nuke moment down to the footing and should safely be distributed to the soil. This is the basic flow of the um, load once it's put on it uh, on the slab. Right now, what makes a one-way slab? If you see this panel, it's not supported by all of its sides, only two sides, right? Although you see 3.2 divided by 3 gives you definitely something less than 2. But that does not make it a two-way slab. This makes it immediately, instantly a one-way slab because only we have um, two supports there. Okay, So uh, the load basically cannot go just to emptiness. It just cannot. And the other way to define a one-way slab is just, as we said, the ratio of the longer span here over the shorter span gives you something uh, more than 2. So this is also a one-way slope, right? So uh, this is what I have just mentioned before, um, about the 3D view of our problem. Um, now uh, I made this on each apps. And you see here we have a slab on grid, we have floor slab, and we have roof slab as well. And this is a solid uh, slab system. That's because we have the beams uh, supporting the uh, slab. Right, so I've got this plan of my uh, building. Now I'm going to discuss about the slab on grid and plus the uh, floor slab and the roof slab in just a moment. But right now we have this building plan. Uh, I've got all the dimensions there, and we have this bay one. Okay, this is one bay, so bay two and three. And inside any bay, we have the panel, panel one and or the uh, panels as well. Now, uh, well, I would I would say that if you design this bay, then bay two and three just follow suit. They gonna be just very similar in the design. Uh, we're not talking about um, any kind of extra loading um, in this bay or this bay. Um, they are all taking the same loading. So we have these panels, and I want to design this continuous one way slab in this particular floor. All right, now, uh, slab on grid. What is meant by, uh, by the slab on grid? Basically, if you take a close look at that, you see that since we are uh, dealing with, or since we are just having the slab on the grid, um, we don't have any basement here, okay? We don't have any basement. So the slab there is resting on, um, on a very compacted, and on, sorry, on a well-compacted soil. You see, this is the slab on grid, and this is the blend beam. Okay, we have the blend beam there, right there, and um, there's no such kind of connection. There's no monolithic connection between them. Their enforcement, okay, the mesh, rebar mesh, does not extend uh, to the to the blend beam. So yes, we have material here. We have kind of material that prevents water from climbing up, but there's no such kind of connection between them, between the beam and the slab. And you see, the rebar mesh comes uh, ready from the factory. It's already welded. Uh, what you need to do is just lay it down there and put the concrete. Now, there's no such a complicity in designing the slab on grid. It's very simple. And again, it is resting on a well-compacted soil. Okay? It's not supported by the beams. Now, the floor slab and the roof slab, they are different because they are hanging. They're taken by the beams. And if you take a close look at them, inside what's what's inside it you see that we have uh, unlike this one here we have this monolithic connection interconnected uh, you see the rebar uh, integrate into uh, uh, the beams rebar as well they all form just um, one continuity okay and well um, the design of this one is definitely different from the design of this one here and that's what we are uh, will be looking at in uh, of course, in the future uh, parts.
Right. So this is my example. I want to design the fist, uh, sorry, the bay one. So bay two and three will be just the same. And well, this is my floor. This is the one I want to design. This is the floor I want to design. And I've got the loading there, the permanent and the impulse load. Now, always remember, when it comes to the slab, you take only one meter strip, okay? The slab is wide. You don't take the entire uh, width of the slab. You just take one meter strip. And if you design this one meter strip, this one and this one and the rest of the bay are gonna be this, exactly the same, okay? So what I have here for this entire floor, I've got this loading. Uh, I'm gonna design the bay one. And I took just one meter strip. Again, I've got the dimensions. I have all the panels and since I'm taking one meter strip, I just multiply the dead load and the life load by uh, the one meter strip. And what I end up having is a UDL. This is very similar to the design of beams. Now I've got the life load, I've got the lift, uh, dead load, I've got also the effective spans, and well, I'm gonna put all the loading. And in this case, I'm <coughs> Excuse me, I'm, I'm going to put it in just uh, uh, an arrangement called all span load arrangement. I've got this UDL, uniform distributed load, uh, all the maximum uh, loading. That's the live load plus dead load. Now, what happens next is that I need to determine the bending moment and the shear force diagram. Remember, you can never ever go through the design process without completing the analysis. It is essential. And that here we have to find the bending moment. We have to work out the bending moment diagram in order to find the sagging of the hogging moments. And then, well, put the flexure reinforcement. Now, the flexure, uh, flexure reinforcement that's for the sagging of the hogging moments, um, they are critical. Uh, either, either you're talking about the beams or the slabs, they must be there. But what's not critical is the shear uh, force. For the Design of slabs, you don't you don't really see usually the uh, kind of shear links, right? And that's true. But uh, if it happened to be um, critical that the resistance of my slab does uh, is less than the applied shear force, then I don't put the shear links. I just increase the depth of my slab. Again, you need to go through analysis in order to find or in order to design your mapper. The structure I'm dealing with is indeterminate. That means I cannot just use the three equilibrium equations. This is not simply supported. I don't have only the sagging moment. Uh, probably you know that the, 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 if you use the if you go for the equilibrium equations, the three equi equilibrium equations, then you can just solve it in half a page. But here, my system is indeterminate. That means I'm gonna need whether well, I go through the moment distribution method. That is too long or I go for the engineering software. This is the most common type of um, analysis on design. It's using your computer, using one of these uh, software packages, or you, can for the, you, you just can go for the simplified method. Now, this, is, this would be our focus. And of course, this is the most type or the most method uh, taught in schools, the simplified method, as per the BS8110. Uh, using coefficients from this table and basically that means you only need to get back to this table okay this is a simplified method these are the coefficients from this table 3.12 of the British Standard Code uh, so this is indeterminate okay this is indeterminate uh, that means if you go th through the bending moment uh, sorry through the moment distribution method that will take pages and it, it's just too long and using this method, simplified method, you just you can really solve it and just have a page. Now, into the table, you see we have the bending moment and the shear force. Okay, our uh, our big concern is with bending moment, and you have this end support, and you have this uh, at first interior support, and so on and so forth. Now, the first column here we have the simple, and we have the continuous. So uh, what I'm saying here is that you need to understand the names there. Now, what is meant by the outer support? The outer support is simply this one here. When it comes to the support, that means the beams. Okay, we have this beam here and we have this beam here. 
So uh, this is going to be a support, but between them we have a span, okay? And this is called the near middle of int span. It's not exactly uh, in the middle of int span, but it's near to middle of int span. All right, next we have the first interior support. This is the first interior support, and it just repeated. Now this is the outer support, right? This is also an outer support because I can start either from this side or from this side. So this is another outer support. And this is, if this is an outer support, then this is the middle of int span. Which one? This is this one. And then uh, the first interior support. If it happened to be that I had uh, a beam right there, then this one would be uh, the interior support. But I don't have any, okay? So uh, middle interior span, this is the middle interior span. Right, we are all set up for this kind of uh, terminologies. And well, this is the bending moment. And this is how it should look like. We have a negative, positive, negative, and so on and so forth. And this is the shear force diagram. If you're not sure about how uh, to draw them, then there are plenty of videos on YouTube and explaining how to draw the bending moment and the shape force diagram for, uh, for either determinate or indeterminate uh, structures. Now, what happens here is that I'm going to need to work out my bending moment, uh, bending moment values. But here, um, well, I have two columns, right? The simple and the column, continuous. But here, it's just the same. Um, I don't have any choices, right? It's just one column. Now, which one would I choose? Is it the simple or the continuous? I want you to remember this. Any conventional building, most of the buildings, RCC buildings, you can go for the simple, okay? But there are some certain conditions that, um, there are some cases that require you going through this continuous uh, in support. Now, of course, uh, the F here is the ultimate design, ultimate load. And we don't take 1.4 and 1.6. Uh, that's because this is the old British standard. We take it 1.35 and 1.5. That's uh, your code, um, ultimate load. And as I said, it is fair to take the simple um, in support since you are constructing a very conventional building and since that most of the RCC buildings, you can assume the outer support to have just partial fixity. Okay, uh, now in our case, we're gonna take the bending moment as zero and that the outer support has this zero bending moment. Now, if this is a zero bending moment, then I must also take the near middle of end span bending moment to be 0 0.086 FM. And that's what I did here. Okay, and face interior support. This is the face interior support. And middle of uh, interior span. This is the middle interior span. So uh, somebody might ask, then what's the point of having this continuous um, end condition? Basically, if you got this shear wall to be an outer support, and we know that the shear wall is very stiff, it's even stiffer than, than the columns. That means in this particular location, it will prevent any kind of rotation. And that basically means it is fair to go, instead of taking the simple end connection, you can take it as continuous. And that the bending moment here has a negative value. We have this holding moment. Okay, so uh, I must put the top reinforcement within this value here. And this is just an example, a real life example. The, the, the beam itself is not that stiff. It will allow kind of rotation. So that's, as I said, it's fair to take, to take it as simple. But when it comes to the shear walls, you can again take it as continuous. And, well, suppose that I want to design this strip of uh, slab. Then what happens here is that I take it as negative because this is shear wall. And, well, I'm ignoring this beam, but if I want to draw it, okay, then it goes to negative, positive, negative, positive, and then negative. Okay, simple as that. Right, so what we have done so far is that uh, we use the simplified method. We took this table, okay, 
uh, in order to find the bending moment and the shear force. And we have this continuous solid slab. And we have our, and we have this uh, bending moment diagram with all the values there. And as again, we said, we take it as simple instead of taking it as continuous. And remember, the real behavior is where you have the negative bending moment. But we're going to compensate this loss of bending moment. We're going to take some of this percentage, some of this bending moment percentage, and put it as top rebar. We cannot just leave it with zero bending moment. We cannot just leave it like uh, as having a zero bending moment without any top reinforcement. That will cause cracking of concrete. And we don't want that to happen. All right, this method requires you uh, to meet with certain conditions. Okay, there are six of them. First of all, the span has to be three or more spans. And equal spans are difference not more than 15%. Predominantly a UDL, life load less than or equal to 1.25 dead load. Also, the life load has to be um, less than five kilometer per meter square. The area of each bay must exceed 30 uh, square meter. Okay, I'm gonna put my example there. I'm gonna put all the conditions. Uh, I'm going to go through them one by one. First of all, uh, I must have three or more spans. Now I've got three spans here, so that is a tick. Another condition is where you have to have equal spans or not more than 15% difference. And that's where it comes uh, to this kind of weird uh, effective spans. Um, again, I put them uh, deliberately. This is because I wanted just to discuss uh, about this point. If you take the largest span here, which is 2.5 uh, minus the least one, 2.2, .2, divided by the original one, multiplied by 100, it gives you 12%. 12% is less than 15%. So that means I am within this limit. That's another tick. Uh, again, in a real life situation, you don't really have it um, with this nearly uh, identical dimension. You probably get them uh, in a uniform uh, spans. So it's like 2.5, 2.5, and then 2.5. But for, this, but for the sake of explaining uh, this method, I just made them uh, nearly identical. Okay, the third condition says that you have to have a predominantly UDL. We don't have any point load, we only have a UDL. That's another tick. For life load less than dead load, we've got our life load less than the dead load. So that's another tick. And the life load also is just less than 5 km per meter square. And the last condition says that the area of each bay must exceed 30 meters square. And you see, you have this bay, and if you do this quick calculation, so this 2.4 plus 2.5 plus 2.2, all multiplied by six, okay, the width. I've got my, then the area of my bay turns out to be 42.6, which is more than 30 more than the required. So that's another tick. So all of that tell me that I am actually eligible to use this method uh, into determining the bending moment and the shear force for my continuous one-way solid slab. Okay? All right, now before I end this uh, part one, there are two points that I must discuss with you um, that are important. Uh, the first one is that the code allows the use of single load uh, case, all spans. Now, you see, I put my load into this form, maximum, maximum, maximum. This is to generate the generate, this is the saggy and the hoggy moment. But it's not the only one there. It's not the only load arrangement. We have this, what's called the alternate span load arrangement. And this is basically when you have the maximum load and then the minimum, which is only the dead load, and then the maximum. Now, life load is movable. It can be here, it can be there. You are the section engineer. You can just play around with it, okay? You can put it here, you can put it there, and you do all of that in order to generate the maximum hogging and the maximum sagging moment. 
Now in this case, this is the alternate spine load arrangement. It is that to create the maximum spine moment. And to get this by logic, if you put the maximum load on the spine, it goes, it just, it pushes down, okay, as far as my, my, it might get, because this adjacent slab has less loading. And this one will also go as down as possible. So the alternate span load arrangement allows you to get the maximum span moment. There's also the adjacent span load arrangement. It's where you put the maximum and the maximum adjacent to each other. And this is in order to find or to generate the maximum hogging moment, the maximum support moment. Okay, so don't think that by uh, putting the maximum load on each span, you will generate the maximum sagging and the hogging moment. No, they are other uh, load arrangements, which if you put them in, into consideration, they do have a significant effect on the, for instance, the sagging moment should be larger than this one here. And the hogging moment right there should also be larger than this one here. But since the code allows you to go for the all span load arrangement, and since that the life load, okay, uh, as this was one of the conditions, the life load is less than the dead load. It's not that significant uh, if you move it around. So um, go for this one, for this all span load arrangement. It's way better and you don't really have to go through all these um, arrangements. So yeah, that is basically the first point. Now the second point, uh, there's this allowance for 20% momentary distribution at the supports. If you use this table, then you are allowing 20% momentary distribution. So what is meant by that? Suppose that I have this uh, steel beam supported by columns and I have this total fixity, I have this fixed support. At the stiffness of the um, of the bolts and have the welding that I made sure I have fixed support. Now what happens is that if I got this fixed support and it was fixed support, then the maximum moment is within this negative, within this hold moment, and I get uh, I get the negative more than the positive. Okay, basically steel is very plastic material. It goes that through that plasticity phase. Okay. Uh, it means it elongates with a slight increment of loading. And this happens just before the collapse at the ultimate load. Okay, now basically that means before, before collapse, I had the fixed supports, but when my beam approaches its uh, collapse, its ultimate load, the support, and since the bending moment here reaches its maximum before the sagging moment, I'm going to end up having this uh, pin support. And that basically means when you have a pin, you don't have any bending moment, right? Let me just share it in this way. This is before the collapse, okay? Before the loading, before the ultimate loading. And this is the elastic bending moment, you see in red. But in blue, that's a plastic bending moment. Now, it reduced. It was here, and it went down there. But at the same time, the sagging moment increased, and again, the hogging moment just decreased. This is the real behavior when it comes to steel. And since we are not dealing just with steel, but with a combination of concrete and rebar. Now the concrete does not possess that property. Rebar does so. And that at the support, I can reduce my bending moment. So it was like this, okay? And then it went down 20%. You see the difference? Now this is not a scale, but it at least shows um, the difference between them. Now this is moment reduced by 20%. And again, this 20% limitation is there because, remember, this is a combination of steel and concrete. Concrete will crack uh, if not limited, okay? The, the concrete does not have that plasticity, not, compared to the, not comparable with the steel. So that's why we limit it to only to 20%. So what happens exactly is this is, okay, the bending moment, okay, before redistribution, and the one below it is the bending moment after redistribution. 
And since you are using the simplified method, the 20% moment redistribution is already included in this table. You don't have to worry about its calculation, it's already included. Now somebody might ask, why would you even mention this? Uh, what's the purpose of this? Why a moment redistribution? And let me just explain it. Now we have the span and we have the support, right? If you take a close look at this, here we have the start, here we have the hogging moment, right? And we have this slab and the beam. This is connection between them. And right there, where we have the maximum sagging moment, we only have the slab, right? Now, what happens here is that we have a space issue here. Now, if I don't do any kind of redistribution, the bending moment is going to be larger, right? So that the slab has to be uh, reinforced in a way that I put more rebars there, uh, thicker in its diameter, and also I have to consider the beam as well. So when it comes to construction, I'm gonna have to deal with this rebar congestion, and that I have to deal with this tiny space. But here, right there, where I have the maximum sagging moment, okay, I only have the slab, and I don't have that much of uh, sorry, I don't have that much of uh, bending moment. Okay, this is before any redistribution. So I have a plenty of space right there, but less rebar. So in order to solve such kind of uh, problems, you go for the redistribution. And let me make it in this simplified way. Okay, you see this in red? This is before redistribution. And this is how it looks like. Okay, before redistribution. I use thicker rebar. Uh, more number of rebars uh, because I have uh, the hogging moment, okay, more than the sagging moment right there. But it, when it comes to a redistribution after redistribution, okay, I don't have to use that much of reinforcement anymore because the bending moment here for the hogging is now less. But remember, after redistribution, this one becomes less, but at the same time, the sagging moment becomes more. It's fine because I don't have to deal with any interconnection, any joint. This is the slab itself. So, so it has got all that space, okay, um, available for, for the slab itself, for slabs rebar only. So it's totally fine. You see here, we don't have uh, as many rebars as compared to this one here. And this is fine because this is, again, this is the slab itself. But when it comes to this beam and slab connection, you really want to avoid this kind of congestion, okay? So this is an advantage for me, okay? Redistribution is an advantage for me. And again, I just limit it because I'm dealing with a composite material. That's the steel and the concrete all together. I don't want my concrete to crack, so that's why I limit it to 20% only. And well, I think this makes this part, part one. Uh, I think it did take time, but uh, this is how it goes in um, civil engineering, if you try to explain everything. Now, um, the next part will again go deeper. And well, till then, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again.